Mark to make a start. Welcome to the ACT branch of the AIIA. My name is Heath McMichael and I'm branch president. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to elders past and present. Tonight we're having another in-depth look at uh, Australia's burgeoning relationship with the Asia-Pacific or Indo-Pacific if, if you prefer. We'll be doing that from the perspective of a uh, rapidly emerging thought leader that describes itself as a do-tank in the region, <laughs> AsiaLynx. Based in Melbourne and with offices around Australia, uh, AsiaLynx is rapidly deepening Australia's engagement with our neighbours in a whole host of areas important for Australia's continuing prosperity in this part of the world. And I'm not going to speak, uh, spe steal our speaker's thunder for tonight. We're very fortunate that uh, the Chief Executive Officer of AsiaLink Group, uh, Martine Letts, could join us from Melbourne. Martine, in fact, came uh, yesterday up to Canberra uh, and kindly served on a panel that uh, we'd organised for students at the uh, ANU in the Cola Bell School there. It was an interactive event uh, for students and young professionals who might be interested in careers in international relations. And uh, Martine's uh, very pertinent comments about uh, the importance of understanding and respecting other cultures, networking and diplomacy, all went down very well, I'm sure. Um, well, I'm personally looking forward to her comments tonight. Let me make a very few comments about uh, uh, Martine's career accomplishments. For commencing at Asia Link in March 2022, she was the CEO of the Committee for Melbourne and before that CEO of the Australia China Business Council. Uh, Martine led business development for the Lowy Institute as its deputy director from 2005 to 2013 and developed community and relief services for the Australian Red Cross as its secretary general from 2001 to 2004. And all of that after being an Australian diplomat for 17 years, including as ambassador to Argentina and advising Foreign Minister Gareth Evans in the 1990s. And we're very pleased that she was awarded a, a fellowship of the AIIA in 2016 and has spoken at AIIA national conferences. Now, as per our normal format, Martin will speak for 20 minutes or so, I think. Give or take. Give or take. <laughs> and then we'll take some questions from the floor and from our online participants through the Q&A function on Zoom. And we uh, will finish at 7 p.m. So over to Martine. Thank you so much, Heath. And thank you very much to you and AIA, ACT branch, for this very kind invitation. Um, the uh, AIA um, delivers an extraordinary service. Um, and um, I do want to quickly pay tribute to um, the late Alan Bidjol, who um, was such a treasured colleague and I think mentor, mentor to half Australia's in the international community um, about how important he thought the AIA was in terms of getting community engagement and interest and, and, um, and an understanding of how important Australia's international relationships are and engagement with the world. So, you know, it's nice for you, Anna. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk a little bit about Asian Link and apologies to those of you who know very well what Asian Link does. Uh, and, uh, with um, some of the challenges and opportunities that I see for Australia's engagement with Asia, occasionally into some of the work that Asia Link is doing or, or Asia Link would like to do. I think it's fair to say that while the Australian government, and there was a lot of hope when Penny Wong first announced the integrated approach to foreign policy, uh, which would have a really, for once, a whole of government uh, which uh, involvement in shaping a much more uh, in-depth, less transactional Asia engagement, Pacific engagement, that we were very excited about the fact that it wouldn't just have to be DFAT carrying the load um, and that there would be all the other departments with significant interest and, of course, in particular with the contemporary agenda of energy, security, um, energy efficiency, climate change, et cetera. Um, I think uh, that's a work in progress, uh, and actually certainly thinks it has something to offer in terms of supporting the government in the stated agenda. We're Australia's leading centre for creative engagement with Asia. Uh, we develop insights, capabilities, and connections through our programs in four areas, the arts, business, diplomacy, and education. We are uniquely Australian, and we're uniquely cross-sectoral. AsiaLink partners with diverse communities across Australia and Asia to build deep understanding of countries, 
people and systems to support the relationships we need for a sustainable and secure future across the region. And as you said, uh, we'd like to think of ourselves more as a do tank rather than a think tank. Uh, we consider ourselves a unique national institution and national asset, able to leverage more than 30 years of deep engagement with our region. I'm going to list some of the areas that I think there are some real uh, opportunities and need for you know, more activity across the board in Australia. And in some cases, we'll link that to the role I think organisations like Asia League can play. First of all, economic engagement and integration. We've always known that we had extraordinary opportunities in Asia, which continues to be the growth engine of the world and is likely to be so for the foreseeable future, even as our region becomes far more contested and complex. With global economic headwinds and potential regional flashpoints such as Taiwan, it is easy to feel discouraged about the state of the region and what the future may hold. But this mindset may be holding us back. The turbulent times and continued disinclination of Australian businesses to find ways to achieve success in Asian markets are consistent obstacles to aid Australia's future prosperity and ambitions to diversify trade and economic partnerships. And the special envoy, Nicholas Small, for the Southeast Asia Economic Engagement Strategy really has his work cut out for him. The practical initiatives to connect Australian business with the region, such as innovation landing pads and trade missions, are essential, but nowhere near sufficient to address this. To overcome that reluctance and inertia, we need to make the case for greater economic engagement and demonstrate the opportunity costs for continuing on our current path. For example, the enormous presence of Canadian pension funds and Southeast Asian investment opportunities is striking, given their relative distance and the lower priority their government accords to the region. Australian super funds will be crowded out if they don't move on this, and yet they seem stubbornly reluctant to do so. So one of the thoughts that we've been kicking around the Asian corridors is uh, the possibility of a landmark report from an organisation like the Productivity Commission on the risk to the Australian economy if we don't become Asia fit, which could galvanize action, turning it into a domestic problem rather than making it still in the minds of many an international problem. And could usefully outline how our partners and competitors are leapfrogging Australia and taking advantage of our absence. Next, expanding our concept of security. Indo-Pacific security is clearly a major preoccupation for the government and many of our partners. But Australia's security in the region goes way beyond the defence partnerships and hardware we are putting considerable dollars into. It lies in strengthening economic and people-to-people -people connections to consolidate trust and create habits of collaboration. Close cooperation on things that matter to the region, such as energy diversification, climate, supply chains, health security, and the digital economy are solid points of common interest where security, when security tensions arise. AsiaLink and the AIIA and other organizations can provide platforms for the generation exploration of new ideas and modes of cooperation in these issues between countries in the region that may not always have considered themselves partners, but are currently very much in the frame to be partners. For example, we launched earlier this month a report here in Canberra on the great potential for Australia-Korea cooperation on the rules-based order. Next, reinvesting in Australian nuclear diplomacy. Restoring Australia's voice in international nuclear arms control diplomacy in the Indo Pacific needs to be a foreign policy priority. This should involve not only reasserting Australia's non proliferation commitments and advocating for the full implementation of existing commitments, but also developing a positive new initiatives focused on the particular challenge of the Indo Pacific region. Despite the current evident tensions um, in the Northern Hemisphere and in, in the Atlantic as a result of the Ukraine war. The most serious long-term risk of nuclear conflict has moved from Europe to and from the North Atlantic to the Indo-Pacific. Our region includes several very tense strategic standoffs involving nuclear arms sex in the region. There is also a need to work on developing mechanisms as the US and the Soviet Union did for nuclear confidence building measures to reduce the risk of accidental nuclear war conflict. No such mechanisms currently exist between the US and China, and in a situation where China is rapidly expanding its nuclear arsenal and range of means of delivery, uh, there is very little being done 
to discuss these things. Uh, I understand, as I think John told me, that there is an ASEAN, there's the ASEAN Regional Forum that's got a small working group on this, but this is not really properly addressing these threats um, and building the kind of uh, regime and confidence building that we require uh, for, uh, for, the, for the region in the future. Next topic, Asia capability. Deepening Australia's Asia capability is essential to the success of our mission. An authentic player in a shared region requires a deep understanding of countries, peoples, and systems in Asia. John McCarthy's been writing a lot about this. We're falling behind. In 2018, 64% of 15 year old Australian students reported language learning was not part of their lives, 64%, compared to an OCD average of just 12%. Australian students also express less interest in learning about other cultures than students across OECD countries. A recent report from the Australian Academy of the Humanities found that Australia's China capability is at risk. Only 17 Australians completed honours in China studies over the period 2017 to 2021, and no more than five in any given year. And university level language programs are decreasing. Now, worth noting that uh, the ANU, for example, uh, back in the heyday, was considered to be, if not the leading, the number two centre in the world for the study of Asian languages and cultures and history. No longer the case. It's a similar story for many of our other strategically important country studies, such as Indonesia. Using the government's own timeline for its Southeast Asia economic engagement strategy, the university graduates of 2040 are entering primary school this year. To build an Asian capable workforce and a cohort of Australians interested and able to engage with our neighbours, we need to be starting with these kids in schools now. We owe it to young Australians to provide the skills they need for the jobs of the future and to be equipped to navigate increasingly complex global strategic challenges and economic relationships. Asia Link's Asia Education Foundation has been working for a long time in advocating for this. Uh, we work to build capability in young Australians and their teachers within very modest means, and we build their connections with students and teachers in the region. What is needed is a full on focus by this government to provide teacher training to allow them to actually teach the curriculum. Because the curriculum is there, it's just not being taught because the teachers don't feel in a position of competence to do the teaching. We need leadership on Asia capability as a national project to embed this across the country using the building blocks that are already there in the national curriculum. Arresting this decline and reinvesting in deep Asia capability should be a matter of national priority. As an education issue, every state has a direct stake in this conversation. Providing and reinvesting in our Asia capability should be put on the agenda for the National Committee of Cabinet. Yes, Brian. Nearly one in five Australians now has Asian heritage, a fact that is often overlooked, not really represented in the media, government and leadership positions we see around us. We have an immense depth of talent and Asian capability already here through diaspora communities and other Australians who have lived and worked in the region. AsiaLink, working with Johnson Partners, is taking the lead on promoting and celebrating their talent through the Asian Australian Leadership Awards. We have been running since 2019. It used to be called 40 Under 40 for those of you that are wondering what it was, but there was some obscure agricultural organization in WA that claims they have trademarked the title and wrote us a letter to six and six and six. So from now on, they're called the Asian Australian Leadership Awards. As the profile of the awards and impressive cohort of former awardees continues to grow, we are looking to the next steps, developing ways to use this platform to connect talented Asian Australian leaders to businesses, communities, and mentors who will value their skills and experience and increase their impact. Working out how to use this incredible capability effectively and appreciate and reward those who bring it to the table will help Australia in its mission to build enduring partnerships with our region, we believe. Indigenous diplomacy in Asia. The government's focus on developing and incorporating Indigenous diplomacy into Australia's foreign policy is timely. From historical trade connections between the Yongle people in Arnhem Land and Makassar traders, to contemporary arts and culture exchange between Australian First Nations artists and Indigenous counterparts in other Asian countries, 
Indigenous diplomacy is of particular relevance to our engagement in Asia. And Asia Link is strongly committed to expanding and promoting the linkages between Australia's Indigenous peoples and cultures and Asia. And this morning, I was uh, had the good fortune to meet with our new ambassador for First Nations people about how we collaborate on this effort. He's only been at the job for six weeks, so he asked me to wait a bit while he gets the team together and develops an agenda and wants to, and wants to consult all around the world. We established the Asia League Leaders First Nations Fellowship in 2020 to promote the inclusion of Indigenous perspectives in Asia engagement and strengthen and elevate Asia capability in First Nations leaders. And there is an additional William Buckland First Nations Fellowship open to Indigenous applicants from Victoria established this year. We note also that two of the Australian curriculum's three cross-curricular priorities directly relate to this work. One, learning about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures, and second, learning about Asia and Australia's engagement with Asia. The Asia Education Foundation of Asia Link is already doing work in this area, and we are looking for opportunities to expand and further integrate these two priorities into our program. Engaging government. One year into a new government, the opportunity and challenge now for organizations like Asia Link is to shift the dial on how government engages with us and how they understand the value we bring to advancing Australia's national interests. The recent renewal of funding for AsiaLink's business capability efforts demonstrates the value the government places on Asian economic engagement. And we will continue to deliver targeted programs to build Australians' Asia business capability and research into key trends and opportunities. We expanded our offering with recent opening of the AsiaLink Business Academy, offering a suite of programs from market-focused training for key regional countries to specific programs on digital and marine economy engagement. But the need is much broader than high quality courses for exporters looking to diversify their markets. The reason Asia Link works cross sectorally is because truly authentic and enduring engagement with Asia needs to be a whole of Australia and whole of society project. And there are opportunities to broaden our engagement beyond the boardroom or even the classroom. Arts and culture are a reflection and projection of who we are. I'd like to recall in this context that um, many Diplomats that I've spoken to, including the current secretary, Jane Adams, and the former secretary of BFA, Peter Dovey, said when they were in the postings, the organization that represented Asian Link was Asian Link Arts. Uh, a, a generation of Australian artists and business administrators had their first introduction to Asia and to the Asian market through Asia Link. And uh, that's uh, because of the residency programs that we had, which were funded by the Australian Council, and the funding was pulled for that about five years ago. We do have a regional regional program involving 30 regional festivals across Australia and the Asia region. It's designed to redress Asia engagement in Australia that biases metropolitan centres and it will enhance the ability of Australian regional festivals to achieve their respective priorities for engagement with Asia and generate greater creative exchanges. Finally, time for an Australian Asia Foundation. As we seek to build a more outwardly focused, sustainable partnership with our neighbours, we need to look at how Australia positions itself in the region. We spend millions on delivering Australian programs in the region through organisations like the Asia Foundation, the American Foundation. They achieve really good outcomes, but there is a gap between us and our partners that is being mediated by another country or organisation. <coughs> we should look to build a uniquely Australian credibility at arm's length from government, but capable of projecting an Australian voice and Australian image to the region, which delivers these sorts of programs under an Australian banner, working directly with local communities. So tonight I've touched teeth on just some of the ideas, actions we believe are some of the building blocks to help manage and even thrive in the challenging but vibrant on the region of ours. Australia's future prosperity and security depends on intergenerational, mm -hmm. strategic, all of community investment in the Indo Pacific. And Australia's only national centre for Asia capability and connections, AsiaNIC is well placed to help make this happen. Right. Thanks very much. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm going to ask people to uh, you know, stand and uh, identify themselves when they give us the question. But just before we start, uh, can I uh, get one in? You've, you've certainly uh, 
told us a lot about uh, the government and about uh, what can the government better do to uh, promote Asia. But uh, could I ask about uh, the business sector a bit more? And uh, are there enough champions for Asia in the business sector? And if there aren't, how can how can there be more cultivated? Do you think? Well, as I said, Nicholas Moore's got his work cut out for him. Mm. Uh, but it's uh, it, I mean, it is it is telling already that this kind of enterprise that was launched by government. There are Australian business is really very comfortable here. Uh, and doesn't really look much beyond shores. Um, and you know, any to the extent that there are any really big Australian companies, very few of them, uh, some of them tried and failed. ANZ comes to mind, Telstra, they went to Asia and then they closed shop them, and things got a bit tricky for them. Mm -hmm. And we are still, uh, despite our huge potential as um, an advanced manufacturing organization, particularly coming out of Victoria in medtech, biotech, all the kind of um, new energy options, uh, hydrogen uh, you know, being a kind of an energy superpower, uh, there is very little really being done by the business community uh, that doesn't want to take very really many risks and it's company risk, it's, it's, it's perceived, you know, it's corruption. It's, there are a lot of, I mean, there's no doubt that there are uh, considerable uh, challenges, but goodness, if the Dutch and the Germans and others could do it, there's no reason why we shouldn't be doing it. And it is very much in our region. So the answer is no. Uh, I don't think they are. I think it's also um, very telling that when Asian Business was established in 2012, uh, it was as a concept with one of the few recommendations of the Asian Century White Paper back in the day. And Mike Smith named it, chaired the committee that made a recommendation that Australia needed a national centre for building an Asian capable workforce. Mm -hmm. And that it should be business led mm -hmm. and not one farming, one browser mm -hmm. zoo came from business. The whole thing was funded by government mm -hmm. through the government contract. Mm -hmm. uh, to get some of these CEOs from businesses to come to our business briefings, if that pays for them to attend. Say no more. All right, now can we take some breaks for that? Take questions? Did I see a hand there? Okay, Bill. Thank you very much, Martin. William Rayner from the ANU. A couple of questions. One relates to the bilateral councils that exist under the deep that's all the Australian India Council, for example. And I was wondering how Asia Link relates or does not relate to those particular councils and whether there's uh, space for fruitful engagement with them. The other question really relates to the universities and the point that you made about the low level of language study within Australia. And I wonder whether that's something which is remediable through injection of further resources or whether it reflects a deeper problem in the tertiary sector where the incentive structure now rewards the bringing in students for high volume courses which that, that replenish the coffers of the university rather than areas such as language study, which notoriously have had small but very dedicated groups of students studying difficult Asian languages. Thanks again. Um, yes, yeah, so the, the on the on the on the councils, um, the uh, you know, as you you know, that they're all very differently resourced. I um, mean, the richest now are the um, centre for the National Centre for the National Foundation for Australian China Relations, and there's now a similar Indian one that's been set up, both based in Sydney. Interesting, I think, given the fact that the majority of the Indian community involved in this actually in Melbourne. Uh, but anyhow, um, and, and then there are sort of the smaller ones like the Australian Korea Foundation, Council Australia, and Open Relations, which I served on, which had, I think, from memory, $500,000 to spend on all of Latin America. Uh, uh, so, um, you know, there, there are millions of dollars for China and India, but nevertheless, um, it is uh, the bidding, for, and we are constantly engaged with them, putting in funding applications. Uh, but it's, um, you know, they get a thousand applications of which about, you know, 40. Are successful at the it's, it's, it's and it's small beer, and sometimes the effort it takes to make an application and to get it all together and all the fun of any kind of stuff, and you never get what you ask for, you always get at a discount. And then, as an organization, if I'm trying to manage our financial future, uh, every time we get one of these grants and use it, it's, got, it's a great thing to do, but it erodes further and further and further the bottom line because we're not properly accounting for how much it costs us to do it to deliver these things. 
then also to note that there is a review that's just been concluded of all the councils um, and whether they should be all put under one umbrella and all of that's still happening. I, don't, I suspect that won't happen. I, I don't think that it was too big a deal, particularly because in the end, China really wants to stand on its own. But yes, look, there are opportunities there. We do collaborate with them. We also put in funding applications, but on a large scheme of things, it's, you know, it's a, yeah, the Australian, well, the, the, the report that we published on Korea was actually from the American Korea Foundation. And we went to the Australian Korea Foundation to amplify that grant. And even that, they loved the application, said it was, you know, uh, best practice, but sorry, we couldn't find you this year. So there's a, it's, it's, there's a world of disappointment with those things. On the um, universities, yeah, look, I think you're right. Although, the, the, one thing to say, there, there is a very live debate going on about how important language really is on its own. So, you know, you can't, you're not going to motivate people to learn a language if it isn't tied somehow to a future job, a career, or an understanding of why this helps you understand the culture or the history of a particular country. So, we, we we talk more when we talk about Asian literacy. We talk about more than language. For us, it's a broad it's a broader concept. Uh, and um, the uh, so and, and, and the classic example is in schools in volcanology. It's always the um, the Hawaiian volcanoes that are this, uh, part of the curriculum, not the ones that are quite the fillers in Indonesia, for example. And that's kind of completely weird. Um, no, no wonder people are interested or, or don't want to learn. But um, there's a there's a hot debate I think going on in the system about you know what's the point in investing in this when there's no demand and it's a bit of a chicken and egg kind of discussion. I think universities have certainly realised given the COVID experience that they desperately need to diversify and for the University of Melbourne among others has now got a new agenda to really become internationally far more engaged and start building connections and capabilities across the full suite of Asian countries rather than the cash cow that is China. Um, the risk is that China will come back too strongly too quickly and that we might just go back again and default to that kind of um, easy dollar. And that will always be an important part of what universities learn. But a number of them, I mean, the G8 and others are left, they are reviewing their strategies for their programs to try and build something that's more sustainable. Questions? Yes, Desmond. Thank you very much, my team. A couple of observations for your comment. Um, we're within about five Ks of one of the most successful multicultural educational uh, colleges in uh, Australia. And I refer to the Australian Defence College just down the road here. At any one time each year, there are about 50 flags are representing individual countries that are represented on the course. And of those, I'd estimate about 20 to 30% are Indo-Pacific. Not only do we bring students here at the major level and at the brigadier level, but we also, of course, where countries have defense colleges, we send our people there. And very often before they go there, they go through the Defense School of Languages so that they have some fluency when they get there. Uh, and this has been going on for half a century. So we can do it. Um, and I just thought I'd make that point and see what your thoughts are about the fact that defense, because it has to, has been working in this area of multiculturalism and uh, representation from the region for a very long time. Yeah, and I think that that is, this is just an opinion, uh, uh, I mean, I think <clears> wrong, but I would say that that's also a testament to the fact that we viewed our, relate, our, our engagement with the region and the challenges from the region very much through a security perspective. Sure. So it's all about, you know, Hearts and minds, and getting the kind of the the the, um, the, 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 the force out there, the representatives of the armed forces to look at how we operate and to build trust and relationships between people. You know, to prepare for when the time of conflict, relationships count. Mm. So I think that's a perfect example. But we should be copying that yes. right across the board. That was my point. <laughs> what do you think about the new Colombo plan? And do you think it's making its mark? Look, um, I know that the New Columbia, all the people, all the individuals who've done the New Columbia plan have said it's changed their lives mm -hmm. and it's been the most rewarding and transformative experience uh, for them. I think it's I think it's a good I think it's a good program. I wish there were I mean, it took a while to, to get students interested in you can't they won't go I mean, a lot of students want to go to China, 
um, that are, uh, as China was close to COVID, it sort of mm. was a bit dormant in, in some areas for a while. But uh, the, the less such um, three two way is, is is terribly important, and I think it certainly makes a real contribution. It's very important. Now, any other? Amanda, Amanda, Amanda Chung from the Council, ACT. Um, in terms of Australia's colonial history, which it shares with some other nations in Southeast Asia, is that it, does that ever come up in your discussions or your travels that um, a lot of the Republican movement is saying that's a very negative for Australia, that especially when it's um, how it's perceived, that we haven't taken that next step. We still are a traditional monarchy and, you know, we get a lot more standing a lot more respect, perspective and take that next step towards mm. being a I have to make a confession. I haven't traveled myself all that much in the region, but the last trip that the, the trip I did to five countries in February, March, um, Malaysia, Singapore, Vietnam, Thailand, and Indonesia. Came up with a couple of people in Malaysia, um, but really more focused now on the US and uh to see, you know, a strong alliance with the US and seeing and acting, that, that's more of a, some people see it as a concern, others amazingly thought things like the quad and um, the locals were actually not a bad thing, mm. uh, provided it wasn't, you know, that the way it was announced was a problem, um, they didn't know about it, that it took them by surprise, uh, that they don't want it to be part of inflaming tensions between the United States and China, but it's not in and of itself not a bad thing to kind of you know maintain presence and keep things under control. So I think there are differing views, but I didn't really hear much about our colonial or the fact that the, the, the you know the, the British Crown was still our, our, our head of state. But look, there are others that have had that feedback. So I don't think it kind of drives. It's not an impediment to any of the relationships that we have. But it was funny. I, I did meet a very senior um, a former ambassador in Singapore. Um, who's also heavily involved with the Asian Society. And um, we were talking about kind of the, the dynamics of the region and the new Filipino president, well, not so new now, but the relatively new Filipino president and the strong relationship that um, the Americans have established with him and that he somehow trying to atone for his father's sins. And then she said, So you have him for a while, you have the Philippines for a while. And I said, Ambassador, who is we? And she said, You know, you, the West. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, Bryce. Uh, hello, Bryce Wakefield from Unomi. I'm the National Executive Director of the Australian Institute of National Affairs. Uh, Kate, it sounds to you, you've um, laid out a lot of problems that uh, I think are problems that think tanks and other organisations are facing across the board. I particularly uh, was was. Uh, we're interested to hear your your uh, your your insights on various uh, DFAT foundations. I wonder. My question is: I wonder why there isn't yet an Australian foundation, um, and it doesn't have to be an Australia Asia foundation. It could be to manage Australia's um, uh, interests around the world. I mean, we we do see. Uh, very influential organizations like the Japan Foundation, the Korea Foundation, who do very good work in promoting Japanese and Korean culture. Is there some sort of cultural cringe in Australia that doesn't allow us to project a unique Australian identity via the foundation? Or is there some other um, some other uh, explanation as to why this doesn't exist? Okay, so um, I was, I've asked around a bit um, of people who uh, have sort of worked in this area, and, and particularly on the sort of development side and others about why has you know has this idea is this just something that you've already thought about? You know, is it, is it dead on arrival because you already went through it and thought deeply about it? And the answer was no. Um, it was the case that we apparently sometime back in the day, and John will know the history of this. We thought about something like. An Australian equivalent of a British Council, um, and that uh, that was for varying reasons um, you know, not deemed to be a priority. But I think um, easier, cheaper to piggyback off um, an established network that's already there. Um, maybe worried about um, there being some sort of misunderstanding about them being confused with Aussie, 
or you know another arm of government. I don't know. I'm just on the beginning of my exploratory journey. I'm going to talk to a couple of former senior people in Aussie about it. Uh, and uh, but but I I really think it was mainly because it was just it's convenient. It's been there since 1954. The reason why I say Asia only because to do it all, I can understand why Australia would not be setting up. Alliance Française and British Council's likes all over the world. That's kind of a bit that that would be not acceptable to the Australian public. I think it would be such a terrible waste of money. But given the fact that we're, you know, we 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 currently, did I mention this? Twenty two percent of Asia Foundation's funding comes from the Australian government. That's publicly available. Twenty two percent. Twenty two percent. The Asia Foundation. Yeah. Twenty two percent of the Asia Foundation's money comes from uh, the Australian government. Not the US. Yeah. And uh, and twenty five percent of its funding comes from an annual allocation from Congress. It's by the bipartisan. That's their platform. That's it. That's what they've got to build on to leverage off. And the rest of it comes from other governments, from that some foundation, some philanthropy, not much. Uh, the office of Thailand alone is fifty percent funded by the Australian government. Mostly, yes. Can I just add something, Martin? mentioned by working in this area at one time. Look, the reason that we haven't got a foundation which really tries to project uh, Australia, I, I use the term people to people because we get if you get into arts or sports, I mean, there are a whole host of things that, that are important, including uh, education, including diplomacy uh, at an informal level. The problem has been that over about 20 or 30 years, we have created these councils like Topsy when there is when it is politically appropriate to do so, or when one particular government thinks it's politically appropriate to do so. So we started off with, you know, nice a million dollars a year for Japan, a million dollars for China, a million dollars for Indonesia, and a uh, million dollars for Korea. So then it grew. We've got now about nine or ten of these things. They're totally, as you say, out of proportion. Mm. Uh, you've got a huge amount of money going into China because we thought we needed to do something to keep the China relationship going because of the doldrums. And we put a huge amount in India, into India because India is now fashion. This is despite the fact that you already have organizations funded by government dealing with India and dealing with China. So you've got two to three of India, you've got two doing Indonesia, much smaller amounts of money. And you've got little ones doing Korea, you've got uh, Thailand, Vietnam and Malaysia pretty well ignored. Uh, what really needs to be done is you really need a major bureau or foundation called what you will that incorporates all these uh, organizations. The problem will be, and I'm sure this is one reason uh, that it's not being tackled meaningfully, is it's damn hard to do. You've got to shake up the bureaucracy for a start, but also there are a huge number of stakeholders in, in these councils. You've got the members of the committees, you've got fear of offending people at the other end, who say India or Korea or Thailand. But you've got it totally out of proportion. You've got three big Southeast Asian countries, which are getting almost nothing. You're getting quite a lot going to Indonesia, and you're now getting huge amounts going to China and India for totally different reasons for both those countries. So really, if uh, I don't know what this review is going to say, but it really is, I think, a crucial uh, endeavor if we could ever get this under to, you know, if we could ever undertake to do this. And obviously, Asia has got, uh, you know, a say in it, we should be pushing, but so should all the other organizations that have an interest in uh, what you might call, I, I hate to use this term soft power because everybody misunderstands it, but look at everybody who has an interest in what is broadly described as the soft power component of our relationship should be pushing for something. And Asia Link is one of the organizations which could contribute most forcefully, I think, to that debate. At the end, right. uh, <laughs> might just get a slip in a question from one of our online yeah. uh, people, uh, Alex Hill, a uh, ANU student. What is the role of Asian development in Australia's engagement with Asia? 
Is there a way that Australia can provide meaningful aid without engaging in the competition with China? Uh, yes, the, um, that the, the uh, I, I reckon overall, uh, from what I can see happening, the role of aid, which depends on which Asian country you're talking about, I mean, some like you know, Laos and others are still very, very small and obviously high dependent mm. still on, on development aid, but the really the bigger uh, in Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, um. Singapore is another kind of you know in other states huge to high standard of living there. But what they're looking for is they want to develop their economies, and what they're looking for is investment in their economies. So they want investment in their digital capability, in climate mitigation, in energy efficiency, in health. Some of the things that I listed before. That's that's the um, so to that extent, then that yes, there is quite a bit of competition coming from China. But um, I don't, uh, you know, the, 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 these countries, what we can contribute is, in, in those areas is expertise and know-how, and there's plenty to go around um, for everyone. So I, I, I don't, you know, there, there are the, the, develop, the development world and the way it targets, you know, that's primarily now the Pacific, I would say, um, more than, more, more than um, in Southeast Asia. And, but to the extent that it is still in Southeast Asia, it's really very much about empowering and enabling them to make their own decisions and look after their own economies. Uh, and uh, I, yeah, I, I don't think that that's necessarily, uh, yeah, there's a bit of a competition in hearts and minds, but I think in some cases we just do it better. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, there are some more questions. Yes, Matthew and then Dennis. Uh, Matthew Newhouse, now at ANU. Um, I very much agree, by the way, with what John has just said. And more broadly, I think we have the absence of the equivalent of a British Council in our diplomacy is something still that needs to be grappled with. But my question is about diaspora communities. You touched on that fairly lightly. There's an expectation internationally, most recently from Europe, where I was, that we are Asia literate, that we know Asia, and not least because we have large diaspora communities. Is there a way in which AsiaLink can mobilize them to support some of the uh, points you've been making to us. Yeah, there is, and yes, we will. I mean, it, it's you know, it's the beginning, and that there is, there is, there are not. This isn't without its challenges. I mean, the diaspora communities, um, just because they, not every Vietnamese person thinks the same way, or or or, 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 or Chinese diaspora, or Indian. You know, in some cases, you've got bilateral business chambers that are competing with one another. You know. Uh, so, so it's it's a, we make a mistake if we think that they're all kind of just waiting there to be ported and and and, and put in their um put, uh, yeah uh, for us to keep drawing on on their expertise and insight. But there is no doubt that um for those that there is a real opportunity to work really hard to provide much more of a platform and profile for uh, members of the diaspora community. Um, that make them more visible, particularly in sort of decision making bodies and, and governments and those sorts of things. We're very, I mean, this, this, this kind of Asian Australian leadership award is the first step that we've taken in being far more consciously um, committed to not just engage, getting Australians to engage with Asia, but also engaging with our community here in a way that has value uh, and that provides um, popular perspectives and um, that takes advantage of an incredible resource. Because now we've really got volume. I mean, it depends on who you talk to. There are some that I've spoken to who say, don't you worry about an Asian capable workforce. With all this migration that's happened, that'll take care of itself. Mm -hmm. Well, I thought that was a bit kind of sweeping. Um, and then, but also the same person said, and the reason why there were no Asian Australians or Asians on Australian major company boards because they have no interest in engaging with Asia. So why would they need uh, you know, Asian company boards, which is pretty damning. So it's a huge amount of work for them. And they're very committed to raising awareness about that and working with um, diasporic communities that you know are getting involved in, 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 in this work and really want to use us and our networks to help them. It's, it's a major, it's going to be one of our major agenda items going forward in the future. Well starting now. Dennis? Uh, Dennis, Dennis Blight, uh, former Australian diplomat, former chief executive of 
IDP, Education Australia, I've written something for I, uh, your mob. Um, I follow on from what John said. There was, in fact, an effort to establish an Australia Council. Not quite competing with the British Council, but in part. This was set up by, in the last years of the Labour government, called the Australia Abroad Council. With Gough Whitlam as the chair of this council. It was dissolved by John Howard within weeks of him taking up the Prime Ministership. But that idea was to bring together all the parties involved in comparable businesses and co comparable activities, funded in part by the revenues we were generating from international students at IDP. It was abolished, but, but it would have been a competitor to the British Council. Now, the British Council is a dying beast. I have to tell you, I, mean, I watched them very closely and I you know, envied them for many years. You know, they were very heavily involved in international student recruitment. Britain was always number one or two. Australia was always number four or five. We, we displaced the Brits as the major destination for foreign students, mostly, uh, in our case, mostly from India and China, also from Indonesia and so on. So I'd really like to box the idea of getting together with the chiefs of that group of institutions to see whether there's not a better way to promote Australian ed education, language and culture abroad in the way that the British Council does. Now, it wouldn't be a, wouldn't be a photocopy of the British Council. It would be quite different because we've got different actors. Each of them would have their own roles. But why can't we get together to establish a more efficient, integrated approach? Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. The thing, I mean, I think so. So, just to say, I think the what we the, the germ of this idea that we're producing is not really to replicate the British Council. Um, it's more uh, to um, deliver uh, a suite of program governments, you know, what management and whatever it is that we're doing at the moment, uh, uh, work which we're paying for, uh, but we're paying another organisation to do it for us. Um, so uh, it's uh, and look, you know, the idea we, we thought about you know, even opening offices, and that's going to cost like a very long term. Uh, but I, I could certainly, I certainly think the idea of talking to like organisations about the international student recruitment business is an interesting one. That's a sort of a standalone idea that wouldn't necessarily be what this organisation that we have in mind. We've only just started thinking about it. So thank you for the for the ideas. The, the idea came up in the report of. Uh, the group set up under Professor Bruce Bennett, who's studying the promotion of Australian studies. And, that, and I wrote a couple of pages in that about the idea of Australia Board of Council was picked up by government when they established that council. Mm. Unfortunately, it didn't work. Any other comments? Bryce again. Uh, sorry, there's just uh, another by the chair. What we're we talking about, and, and sorry to belabor the point about these, these councils, but um, what we are talking about with um, the various councils that are set up, the Australia, um, the Indonesia Council, the Australia Japan Council, etc., are, um, are councils that are primarily about funding um, Australians uh, and their knowledge of um, uh, of, of, of of Asia. Uh, whereas a lot of what's being talked about tonight is is a British council model or to make your human animals from says, which are more about funding overseas people to get to know the country in question, in this case, Australia, right? And um, I wonder, um, I wonder if the if the focus of our conversation should be more about that. And I wonder to what extent does Asia Link uh, actually focus? I mean, it's probably not your stated mission or your mission statement but i wonder i wonder if there there is a side mission of you um bringing in knowledge of australia from overseas because there are other countries that do this obviously british council but uh, but uh, another organization as well. well the asia foundation has 18 offices in asia, in asia. the asia foundation does yeah you 
really sorry. <laughs> John, you've got one, then, then John. Yeah. Okay. Uh, John, to a member of the local chapter of the Institute. Uh, Martin, first of all, to say I think it's wonderful that the uh, Asia Link is taking on nuclear diplomacy as one of its uh, strands of interest. And quite clear to me that nuclear issues in the region broadly are growing in, in importance, both from a strategic point of view in North Asia and the rest, but also in the Pacific with uh, new concerns about uh, various nuclear related subjects. But the question I wanted to put to you was more to do with um, Australia's relations with Southeast Asia in particular. Two weeks ago, we had Stephen Jedgett from ABC talking here. Very, I thought, very decent uh, presentation about the ABC's efforts to uh, um, get reporting on Asia Pacific into some sort of decent format, in the, at least with the ABC. I, I think we forget about the others for the moment. If we can get the ABC right, though, we'd be on good set of tracks. But frankly, and he admitted that Southeast Asia is just very much a hard case for reporters. I think, frankly, they're just a disaster. The current set of reporters are reporting silly things like the idiot behavior of Australian uh, tourists and what sort of thing. Uh, Consular cases, okay, but you know, plus it is more important things. The, the Thai, uh, Bangkok, uh, Thailand elections hardly got to mention. You would struggle to find out the ASEAN summit last week in Bali. Is there something Asia Link can do to stimulate um, Australian media into a more educated um, take on the region? Yes, I mean, we could advocate for it, but it's, 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 it's this, we wouldn't be the first. Um, I mean, media, God. Uh, there, 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 there's, there's so many different ways now to get information, and the traditional media is really struck. So we're still trying to keep up with stuff that is being done you know, on Twitter and TikTok and Facebook and whatever else, and, uh, and other platforms. Um, and, you know, the Australian audience is not interested in. For the sort of centuries of the televisions, but not really only the things that you know they come here to their resorts and can enjoy the kind of advantages that as tourists and I'm sort of making a bit of a joke to make my point, but um can you generate more interest by better commentary? Uh yes, um I think you can. I thought it was interesting that Judith Nielsen, uh the Judith Nielsen Media Center actually was had that as a little bit of its, its objective. Is to get more, or certainly to have more journalists reporting from the region. Um, but she paid a strong financial review and uh, <laughs> people uh, reporting out of the region, um, which is weird. Um, but uh, and anyway, the whole thing seems to have almost even something to do with the media center. I think most of the, the, the board, most of the board resigned and then the executive resigned. But there was some. You know, somebody who's actually got a commitment and has put some money into it did actually have a crack at it. Uh, and <laughs> who, who at the ABC is constantly um, obsessed with, I guess, relevance to sort of local you know, international issues, not the Russian international. And there's the other venture when we look at the ABC. Um, so, yes, it's, it's, it's important. Um, how do you make news from that region interesting, popular, watched, listened to? How do you cope the demand for it? Uh, that's the good question. And I don't know the answer to it. Because we do, it's only when there are terrible things that happen or Aussies, you know, Aussies get caught out or. I mean, it's a little bit like the European media and other money report on shark tanks in Australia. Uh, you know, big animals doing weird things. I mean, it's a little bit similar the, at the, from the other end of the spectrum as well. There's not that much mainstream interest in these things. It's a real problem. I mean, the people who are actually trying to do something about this are some of the members of the media themselves, but it's uphill for them. Mm. And the editors, you know, get to the stage where they, they look at what the audience wants. I mean, they basically feed the audience what, they, what they're asking for. The countries which follow foreign affairs by far more closely than any other country, Japan and Germany, 
Americans do, but in a very narrow belt. Uh, and you know, you look at the, well, the British papers, and we, we tend to you know, read the better ones here, uh, if you're in there at all. But and, uh, by and large, you look at Britain, it's pretty much. You look at the, you know, the eight or nine pop newspapers there. But the BBC so, does a pretty good job. They do a very good it's job. Right. They've institutionally, they've got you know, a certain institutional. which keeps keeps them going. We've never quite got that. Mm, but certainly, um, you could do a lot of cutting in Australia. Mm. Australia. Even that was into the range of the Pacific region. And what a what a, what a disaster that was. Mm. Um, yeah, that's that's gradually yeah, some of that. That's some of that being like restored. It. Gradually being restored. Yeah. Martina, I'd just like to inject a question from Penny Wensley, who's online, uh, who sees a, a real appetite and a substantial opportunity to deepen engagement in environment and agriculture. So I wonder if you could comment on that from the Asia West point of view. Yes, see myself. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's no, there, there is, I mean, and, and look, that's a lot, a lot of the, um, the actual um, discussions uh, between, you know, governments of, of, of this very, Topic. Um, although interestingly, I was talking to somebody um, today who's uh, working closely with um, some major um, North Asian or Korean companies about uh, tapping into this huge potential that we have as an energy superpower and trying to really interested in kind of drawing on that on on, on that potential, but finding that again um, that we um, there is not uh, that we need it's businesses and governments being a little bit slow in responding to um to that to, to make it sort of easier for those companies to really put down some significant you know, providing i guess a bit of risk protection and those kinds of things but i absolutely right every time we speak to in well certainly the southeast asian countries and more broadly but also in japan and korea on the, the environmental know-how the, the the technologies that we can offer can help and countries are now committed to certain to zero emission targets by a certain but not too distant future. And there is a lot of appetite for know-how and uh, also the resources that Australia has to help them with that. So it's good that we've at least finally um, changed our policy in a way that uh, at least for the foreseeable future it doesn't make that any, it does, doesn't doesn't make it an issue anymore. And the observation was all and then I, I sort of said, well, what happened with you know, let's say the coalition gets back in again. Um, you know, what will that set us back in? But but it's it's gone too far. But the the, the, the plans moved on. And there's just so much business now that is completely signed up for this new one. And what's the domestic stuff of the on coal and, and other um, you know, carbon intensive fuels um, that really and, and also from an electric perspective, um, at least in the metropolitan areas, turn the rules off completely. So it looks like we one hopes that this policy will be one that kind of gets continued you know, no matter who gets elected to do this government. Thanks very much. And now I think we've got time for one more question. How about Bill? Yeah, uh, just a quick question about <coughs> the diasporas uh, and how they might, as they grow in Australia, affect our framing of what Asia actually involves. Historically, very often when people talk about Asia, they've been East Asia, Southeast Asia, perhaps South Asia. But we have a growing diaspora from Central Asia in Australia now. It doesn't mean people from Afghanistan. But the numbers have increased from fewer than 1,000 40 years ago to over 100,000 Afghanistan born uh, residents in Australia in the latest census. And I'm, I'm wondering whether this, in not just in that particular case, but in other cases, has the potential to create a dynamic which will also affect our focus to some degree. On, on what in Asia and Asian interests you might think. Um, yes, uh, in our little tiny awards, for example, or not that, not so tiny, we, we give out, we shortlist 40 people and then we, there, there are 10 categories. And we've had winners certainly from, or, or section winners um, from Afghanistan, even, and in fact, we, we've actually made people from Afghanistan, Iran, and some of the stands eligible um, to compete for those awards. So from Asian's perspective, it's a pretty broad church. 
Oh, well, in a uh, room two to four smart team. Thanks so much for coming all the way from Melbourne for it. And on behalf of the ACT branch and those of us here present of the Institute, please accept a small memento. I hope you come back again soon. Thank you.